Okay, let's get started. I want to welcome everybody um, to this evening's um, important webinar with Integrity First for America. We have with us a very special guest, Amy Spitalnik. Hi, Amy. Thank you for joining us this evening, what I know is a very busy time for you. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, so, you know, let's jump right in and get right to it because I know we have a lot to cover in just one hour and I want to leave time for um, question and answers. Um, um, so the format for tonight will be, um, you'll just be able to see myself and Amy, but about 40 minutes in, we will open it up to question and answers, which we will take, and then I'll have a chance to ask Amy um, after she's made a few introductory remarks and we've had a, a, a few questions um, to set the, set, the, set the webinar accordingly. Um, so Amy, what a moment. Um, when we began planning this event, I think we all anticipated a conversation about the cycle of hate and its impact on our country today. Um, and while we understand the impact of racism is not new, George Floyd's death obviously has since inspired the largest collective civil rights action of our time, which has happened since you and I first discussed even planning this webinar to begin with. Um, so with that crucial topic in the background, um, which, is, which is front of mind, and because, particularly because your work is focusing on defunding right-wing extremist groups, how do you see your work intersecting with this current moment? So it's impossible to separate what's happening in the world right now, and in particular these really inspiring and frankly quite successful protests, given that they've only been happening for about a month and we've already seen specific policy changes, both on the governmental and private sector side. Um, it's impossible to separate everything that's happening in the world right now with the broader systemic issues that also have fueled the rise of far right violent extremism in recent years. These are all part of the same broken racist system that both the protests and our lawsuit and the work that Millions of Conversations and so many other organizations and efforts are trying to combat through different mechanisms. Um, and so while protests are one way to take critical, tangible action, they are also part of a larger system that needs to be fixed. And our lawsuit provides a very specific, tangible way to take on violent extremism through the courts, using the laws that we have at our disposal, using our justice system, and the rule of law that is meant to protect us, and in particular, our plaintiffs who are victims of this violent extremism. Um, so I, I don't think you can look at what's happening right now and not see it in the broader context of the cycle of hate and extremism that has only grown in recent years. Um, and particularly when you look at what happened in Charlottesville nearly three years ago, this August will be the third anniversary of the Charlottesville violence. The same racism that we see at play right now, the same racism that people are calling out desperately for change and, for, and to be addressed on all of the levels it exists, was sort of laid bare and on display in Charlottesville. It was at the core of what the neo-Nazis and white supremacists who attacked Charlottesville chanted the core of their ideology. They went there under the guise of defending Confederate statues. They, um, they chanted things like all lives matter and Jews will not replace us. And again, this is all part of this broader systemic system, uh, rather this broader systemic issue um, that has sort of, you know, you see manifest in countless ways um, and that, at least when it comes to what happened in Charlottesville, provides a concrete, tangible way to fight back through the form of the litigation. Oop, I think you're muted. Thank you. I want to get into um, the case itself in a moment, but I actually I want to take a step back and personalize this for a moment because I've, I've spoken to you several times about this now, and I can tell that that you are taking on this case at great risk. Um, to your own personal safety. And also, um, I know that, that this has been an issue that you've been fighting now for over a decade um, and the rise of extremism. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what drew you to this work in the first place? Um, and also where you were when, when, when the Unite the Right rally happened and the violence happened in Charlottesville three years ago. And give us a little context about what you were thinking. 
Yeah. So my background has been in government and politics for most of my career. Um, I most recently worked in the New York Attorney General's office as the communications director and senior policy advisor. And in that role, you know, the idea of equal justice was central to everything we did. And in particular, I was in that office as we started to see in an alarming rise in hate crimes and other forms of extremism in 2016, most notably in November 2016 after the election. And so among much, a lot of work that we did in that office, one thing that you know I think has become sadly far more relevant than perhaps we even realized at the time was we put out guidance to local governments, police, um, and others around the state making clear their responsibilities to enforce local and state hate crimes laws. And what, give, years, what years were these, Amy? This was, well, this specifically, that guidance was in November 2016, which as I think many people remember, sadly, was sort of a preview of what was to come over the subsequent years when we started to see an uptick in hate crimes and targeting people of color uh, and others in the aftermath of the election. There was a certain emboldenedness that started to become more apparent that I think in many ways manifested in Charlottesville, where so many of these extremists had no shame marching on an American city with their faces clear, their names next to all the threats that they made online. Um, and so, you know, the work that I was privileged to get to do in the New York AG's office, and before that in, in the mayor's office and in other places um, in New York government, directly informs the work that we're doing now because they're all predicated on the idea that we're entitled to equal justice under the law. And that we have a rule of law, we have a system of laws that is meant to protect the people that it serves. And when it doesn't, when something happens and someone's rights are fundamentally violated, there is an obligation for someone to do something about it. And those people should have some form of recourse. And I think for me, you know, the what we do at IFA is so particularly relevant at this moment because we were living at a time when the federal government is not protecting people's rights in the ways that they're required to. And so when Integrity First for America was conceived of in, um, in the uh, sort of towards the beginning of the Trump administration, mm -hmm. there was an understanding by many that this Department of Justice and in particular its Civil Rights Division would be unlikely to pursue these sorts of cases with the same vigor or interest that prior administrations had. Mm -hmm. And sadly, that's worn out. Really sad and horrifying statistics over the last few years that show DOJ civil rights investigations are down two thirds compared to where they were four years ago. Two thirds. Yes. Wow. As of last year, but I suspect that they are. I, I suspect the numbers are not any better this year. Um, and likewise, we've seen this administration cut programs focused on combating extremism. Uh, com combating domestic terrorism, including a domestic terror intelligence unit at the Department of Homeland Security, um, and sort of actively disinvest in the sort of civil rights and anti-extremism work that was a hallmark of the DOJ Civil Rights Division, frankly, the reason it was created. And so knowing that there would unfortunately be a lack of interest, to put it politely, mm -hmm. on certain uh, on the part of the federal government, it makes private plaintiffs all the more important. It makes people who are willing to stand and fight for their rights all the more critical if you don't have someone in the federal government who will necessarily do it for you. Right. Um, so in that way, watching that transition, being in the New York AG's office as we watched that transition and as state AGs in many cases had to step up to fill that void, also made it crystal clear to me and to so many of my colleagues um, including our brilliant legal team, that there needed to be, that something needed to happen here when Charlottesville occurred and that it would take private individuals bravely doing something I to fill that void. I see. So it's making your role even more important than ever before, really, and Integrity First for America and the case that you're bringing. So in this landmark case, can you can you tell our audience, because I think this is the first time that so many people who are, who are tuning in have heard about um, this case. Can you tell us about the case um, um, from start to finish? Um, I think, you know, it's so easy to forget in the, in the news cycle that we live in, that three years ago, an American city was attacked by hundreds of far-right violent 
extremists who were there with the goal of targeting people based on their race, their religion, or their willingness to stand up for others. But that is sadly exactly what happens. And before I dive into the nitty gritty of the case, I think it's worth remembering the details of August 2017. Um, first, on the night of Friday, August 11th, many of us might remember those horrific images of neo-Nazis and white supremacists carrying tiki torches marching on the University of Virginia, um, wear, wear, watch, uh, wearing their matching uniforms of polo shirts and khakis, chanting things like Jews will not replace us, all lives matter, um, blood and soil. The tiki torches were meant to be evocative of both neo uh, or rather both Nazi and KKK Use, uses of torches and fire in their own hate. Um, and it was terrifying. I mean, if you look at those images, you can't deny that it was terrifying. And on that night, they descended on the University of Virginia, intentionally walking through areas filled with students who were there over the summer, and ultimately surrounded a group of peaceful counter protesters who were at the Thomas Jefferson statue on campus. They right. fuel at them, threw torches at them, kicked and punched them. One of our plaintiffs, uh, uh, African-American man who is pseudonymous and that he has been so afraid for his safety in the aftermath of what happened, he didn't, he couldn't even put his name on the lawsuit. Um, he uh, said he thought he was going to die that night. Um, similarly, a few blocks away, one of our other plaintiffs, Seth Wispoy, who's a reverend, was hosting an interfaith gathering, um, and they had to ultimately shelter in place because it was too unsafe for them to evacuate and leave because they were surrounded by neo-Nazis and other extremists who had descended on the University of Virginia. The following day, sadly, was no different. Um, instead of marching on UVA, they marched on downtown Charlottesville. They were there under the guise of protesting the removal of a Confederate monument, but as I'll explain in a second, that is not at all why they were actually there. They were there to terrorize and bring violence to the streets of Charlottesville. Um, they, among many other horrible anecdotes from that day, surrounded the local synagogue, which was celebrating Shabbat. It was a Friday, Saturday morning. The synagogue had to shelter in place and then evacuate people out the back when they could. They also evacuated their Torah scrolls at the back. And the detail that always sticks with me most um, is a Torah that um, the synagogue was home to was saved decades ago from Nazi Germany. And uh, it was a Holocaust scroll, as they're called. And here in 2017, it was yet again under Nazi threat, except in America, on our own streets. And that gets me every single time. Um, and then, of course, the violence continued. There was a line of interfaith clergy, Jews, Muslims, Christians, others who had united and said that hate has no place in our community. Um, they were charged by these neo-Nazis and other extremists. Many were injured, including our plaintiff, Reverend Wispelway. Um, and then, of course, we all know how the day culminated with James Fields driving his car into a crowd of peaceful counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer, injuring many others, including many of our plaintiffs. If you know that Pulitzer winning photo of the car attack, um, you can see many of our plaintiffs in it, including Marcus Martin, an African American man who sort of splayed across the back of the car. His then fiance, now wife Marissa, he had just pushed out of the way. Um, and a number of our other plaintiffs, including Natalie Romero, whose skull was fractured, um, and many others. Their injuries were both horrific in terms of the physical sense, and of course, you could imagine the psychological and emotional injuries they've also sustained um, simply for peacefully protesting against white supremacy in their hometown. And what's so important to understand about all of this is that none, nothing was an accident here. Right. This all the result of months of meticulous online planning by these uh, by these neo-Nazis white supremacists. Go into that a little bit more, please. Yeah, about the mm -hmm. online planning of our lawsuit. Um, you know, if this is not a case about speech, it's not a case about incitement. It's about the fact that for months in advance, these extremists planned to bring violence to Charlottesville, and they talked about every last detail in advance on these online chats, specifically on a platform called Discord which is typically used by video gamers to communicate while they're playing. Hmm. Uh, and in these chats, they had a number of channels. They talked about everything from what to wear, hence the matching uniforms, what to bring for lunch. They, they discussed whether mayonnaise would spoil in the sun and which gluten-free bre bread to bring because the banality of evil is real. Um, and then of course they talked about 
which weapons to carry, how they would, quote, crack Tommy's skulls, um, how they could use their supposed free speech instruments as weapons if they, if they decided they needed to, and even whether they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which is, of course, exactly what they did. Um, and these chats are as horrific as you could expect. There are memes like John Deere's new protester digester with an image of a tractor, supposedly, uh, meant to show how they would plow over these protesters with a vehicle that was posted in July of 2017, a month before the violence happened, along with other comments about how they wanted to hit protesters with cars. And so again, nothing here was an accident. It was the result of a meticulous, of meticulous planning. And as we allege in our lawsuit, a racist, violent conspiracy to harm people based on who they are, the color of their skin, what they believe, and their willingness to defend others' rights. And so on, um, on behalf of a coalition of Charlottesville community members who were injured in that violence, including many of the folks I just mentioned, um, we are supporting this, um, this litigation, this lawsuit against the two dozen individuals and hate groups that orchestrated the violence. We're not suing the hundreds and hundreds of neo-Nazis and white supremacists who came to Charlottesville. Specifically based on these chats and other communication, we are suing the two dozen individuals and groups that orchestrated the violence and then helped execute it. So the ringleaders of this violence. Um, the, there's so much to say about the case and I'm sure we'll dive into it now. I mean, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I guess um, that's, <laughs> um, that's a definitely a particular interest for me. Um, but, but, it, but it is important, the details of the case are important because so much of what happened we're seeing um, happening right before our eyes today as well, three years later. So I think it, these details are important, including how did you identify um, the, the dozen um, defendants? that the groups that you have identified, as you mentioned, there were hundreds of people who participated and who, who conspired, but how did, you, how did you narrow it down to these, these um, tw around 12 defendants? 24, actually. Sorry, 24. It's still, but it's still a small amount compared to the number, yeah. right? And so we had a very lucky break pretty early on. So Charlotte, uh, as soon after the Unite the Right violence happened, a nonprofit journalism outfit called Unicorn Riot and I would urge you all to check them out. They do really interesting work, particularly right now around the protests. Um, they're doing some great journalism. Um, they got their hands on the trove of Discord chats where this violence was planned. Of course, we wish that someone had gotten their hands on it before the violence happened. Right. We wouldn't have had, had a case in the same way. There would have been obviously probably a case, not this case. Right. Um, but they released these chats out into the world. And it was crystal clear if you read them, and they're still publicly available both on Unicorn Riot's website and also detailed extensively in our complaint, which you can read on our website, uh, integrityfirstforamerica.org, and we'll be sure to send it out to folks um, if you're interested. And I would encourage you to read it because one, even if you're not a lawyer, I think it's a pretty, I don't wanna say a good read, it's a horrifying read, but it, um, is an accessible read for anyone, lawyer or not. And two, it really is the only place where the full history of what happened in Charlottesville and how it was planned and executed is so meticulously written down, um, especially, um, you know, particularly in the aftermath of the violence that our complaint was filed in October of 2017. So it happened pretty quickly and allowed us to get what actually happened out on the public record in a very clear way. Um, and so through those chats, if you read them, you can make, you can really understand who those ringleaders are, who is responsible for organizing people to come, um, in some cases specifically directing them which types of weapons to bring and, you know, how they should go to different Walmarts and other places around the region so not as to tip people off to the large amounts of tiki torches they would be buying and organizing white vans to drive them. Um, to get, it was very well organized. Again, these, this was not sort of a ragtag group of people showing up in Charlottesville. It was planned for months in advance and the level of detail that went into it makes clear that nothing that happened was an accident. And so through those chats and other communications, we were able to identify who the ringleaders are. Unsurprisingly, the leaders are the names that I suspect many people will also recognize. So people like Richard Spencer, who coined the term right, Andrew England, Chris Cantwell, um, Identity Europa, which now goes by American Identity Movement, League of the South, Vanguard America, which now goes by Patriot Front, right. um, whole National Socialist Movement, 
Jeff Scoop. These are the names that kept cropping up over and over again for folks who were following violent extremism in America. These are truly the leaders of the neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement um, in the United States. Of course, they also have deep ties to global extremism, which we, I'm sure we can talk about as well. But unsurprisingly, the defendants in the suit and those who were the ringleaders in Charlottesville are one and the same with the broader leadership of the movement. And, um, you know, it, it speaks to both the, to, of course, we believe this case is important for justice for our plaintiffs and for accountability for what happened, but this case can also have an outsized impact in the fight against violent extremism because of who the defendants are and because of how bankrupting and dismantling them through large civil judgments and other actions can make a major dent in their ability to operate. And we've actually started to already see that even before we get to that. And that's a good question. I mean, that, that leads really well into this next question, which is what, tell us about some of the, I know you've already had some um, wins and some milestones that you've already achieved over the past um, year to two years. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, so litigating against neo-Nazis is not fast and it's not easy. And they have really tried every trick in the book to try to avoid accountability here, unsurprisingly. And our legal team, we have a brilliant legal team um, of attorneys, um, including Roberta Kaplan, who represented Edie Windsor in the marriage equality case that struck down DOMA, um, you know, Karen Dunn, Michael Block, Jessica Phillips, Ellen Levine. These are um, some of the best litigators in the country and we're so lucky to have them doing this for us and for our brief plaintiffs. Um, and they have been tireless. They have ensured that every step of the way, every time one of our defendants, and in many cases, most of our defendants try to escape accountability, um, we will hold them to account for their discovery obligations to turn over their evidence they're required to, and to, of course, hold them accountable for what they did in Charlottesville two and a half years ago. And so first, the defendants unsurprisingly tried to have the case thrown out. They filed what's called a motion to dismiss um, that, was squarely rejected by the court in July of 2018. Um, that decision is on our website. And I would also suggest folks, whether they're lawyers or not, give it a read because it's a really important decision that lays out how, for example, the First Amendment does not protect violence. Yeah, and I want you to go into that to the extent that you've got time. Yeah, I think, you know, like if what's really important to understand is that if they had gone to Charlottesville and simply protested holding their horrible signs and maybe even carrying some of their weapons, and sh and shouting their heinous, racist, anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, homophobic beliefs, um, but didn't plan and execute violence, they would have likely been well within their rights. And as heinous and odious as we find their views, they would have had every right to stand there shouting them and holding up signs to that effect because they that would be for a First Amendment protected action. Right. The difference is that instead of doing that, they planned in advance online to bring violence to Charlottesville, talking about it in pretty meticulous detail, as I described earlier, and then they went and did it. And much like if you and I talked on this Zoom call or on email or chat, Discord chats, whatever, yeah. about how we planned to rob a bank, and then we went and robbed the bank, <laughs> our communications wouldn't be protected, neither are their chats. <laughs> right. <laughs> violent racist conspiracy. And right. so the judge laid this out in very clear terms um, and said, if we prove the facts as detailed in our complaint, we will of course have a case. Um, and um, also threw out a number of their other arguments um, and upheld near basically all of our case for the most part, um, which is I think fairly extraordinary in a case as large as ours, especially given two dozen defendants right. and plaintiffs and a variety of different claims. Right. And so that was, I think, the first major win in that it obviously sent a clear signal that we are proceeding, there's a case here, right. and then yes. and we moved to the discovery phase, the evidence collection phase, which has been um, tough, to say the least, in that unsurprisingly, neo-Nazis are not adherents to the rule of law in the same way you and I might be. And so... They have really tried, like I said, every trick to try to avoid accountability here, claiming bankruptcy. My phone fell in the toilet. It's literally like the neo-Nazi version of the dog ate my homework. Um, you really couldn't make some of this up if you tried. However, we have been like a dog with a bone to keep with the dog met metaphor, I guess. You have to be, yeah. And uh, we have, in you know, 
kept going to the court, making sure that these defendants are held to their discovery obligations and required to turn over their phones, computers, social media accounts, email accounts that are critical evidence in this case. And we've won a number of orders um, requiring them to turn over evidence. Of course, in some of those cases, the defendants still don't comply with those orders. So we filed sanctions motions against them and have won significant financial penalties against a number of the defendants, including just a few weeks ago, over $41,000 against three key defendants, two individuals and one group, um, Matthew Heinbach, Elliot Klein, and Vanguard America, who were really three of the key leaders of this movement. Um, one was actually even thrown in jail for contempt of court for failure to comply, which again speaks to just how, you know, as a lawyer, you know, it is probably fairly unheard of for a defendant in a civil case like this to be um, found in contempt of court and then thrown in jail in that way. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we they are seeing the legal and the financial penalties for failure to comply. Unsurprisingly, once those sanctions started coming, all of a sudden the evidence started showing up much more rapidly than it previously was. And in the last few weeks also, we've won um, a number of really strong um, orders from the court granting our motion to compel discovery from a number of defendants. So that includes National Socialist Movement and its current commander, as well as its former commander, Jeff Scoop, um, and others, which has been, um, again, very heartening. It shouldn't, you know, you would think some of these things are a given, and that if they're faced with significant penalties, they would at least turn over the evidence, but it has been a fight. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, and there's this article is on our website, the Daily Beast published it over the weekend, um, their own lawyers have called them out for failure to comply, which I think is particularly extraordinary. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we are trucking full steam ahead to the extent possible. We are scheduled for trial in October and we are operating under the assumption that that's happening. The only reason it wouldn't happen is if the pandemic doesn't allow it. Yeah. Um, settlement to be had here. Um, so we are going to trial whenever a trial is possible and potentially in October, which is our current date. Um, and we are still operating as if that's the case. We're doing depositions via video chat. We are continuing um, to file these motions to compel and to collect the remaining evidence. Um, and, and we are ensuring that they are held accountable to every single one of their obligations here. So what does a win for you look like? And what is one of your, what are, what's your main goal with this case? And what's, what are your primary goals for Integrity First for America in general? Well, I think there's so, there's so much that this case can do. Yeah. But I, it's important to understand first and foremost that our goal is about justice for our plaintiffs. Right. And right. Go to the two dozen individuals and groups that, that were responsible for the violence in Charlottesville. There has been so little accountability in the aftermath of what was the most heinous, large-scale, neo-Nazi attack on an American city. And in normal times, we would still be talking about what happened in Charlottesville on a regular basis, and we would have seen real consequences, but we are not living in normal times right now. No, we're not. So ensuring that there is accountability for those who are responsible for what happened is so important. There has been a prosecution against James Fields who drove the car and a handful of individual prosecutions for assault and other charges, um, but not a ton of large scale or rather broader accountability for the leadership responsible. Um, and in particular, um, we think that that is, we think that's important for a number of reasons. But because of who the defendants are, because of their centrality to this movement, there are also other implications that this case can have. So we've already talked about the ways in which we won large sanctions and other financial and legal yeah. penalties. When we go to trial and win major financial penalties, civil judgments from a jury on behalf of our plaintiffs, those have the potential to bankrupt and dismantle the groups and the leaders that are at the center of this movement. Richard Spencer has already complained that this case is, quote, financially crippling. League of the South said they can't open a new headquarters because of the case. Some have tried to rebrand as a means to sort of shed the stigma of this case. Of course, we are not allowing them to escape accountability even after they rebrand. Um, some have tried to claim that they're leaving the movement and there's much skepticism around that. Many of their former colleagues and also experts on extremism 
believe that it's just a means to try to escape accountability in a lawsuit, which of course they are still liable for what they did two and a half years ago, even if they now claim they've reformed. And so we're already starting to see that impact. And when we win these large scale um, civil judgments at trial, that will have a major impact. And I, I think it's important to also understand just how deeply connected these individuals and groups are to this broader movement. So for example, we know that the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 at the Tree of Life Synagogue a year and a half ago communicated on Gab, which is a right-wing site, with some of the Charlottesville leaders before his attack. We know that the Christchurch shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque in um, New Zealand about a year ago painted onto his gun a symbol known as the Fatch tag, first popularized by one of our defendants. That same symbol was found at the Highlander Center arson attack last year. Um, and over and over again, we see these deep disturbing connections that show the centrality of our defendants to this broader movement. There's so much to say as well about their role in both violence and extremism during coronavirus and now that as well. I want to get into that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'll pass over it for now. Um, we can come back to it. But suffice it to say that these individuals and groups truly are at the center of this larger movement with these deep disturbing connections, some of which I've outlined. And so by taking them on and bankrupting and dismantling them through, through these large civil judgments, this case can have an outsized impact. Yeah. And then finally, and, and in addition and related to that, um, there's also the importance of the trial itself. And Robbie Kaplan, one of our lead counsels, likes to talk about how every decade or so there's a trial in this country that is really about more than just the parties and is a real educational and learning opportunity for the country. And I can't think of a moment when, I mean, well, I could think of a moment when we were more in need of an education on racial justice. Yeah. And, um, but suffice it to say that we are certainly at a time when a case like this will send a clear public message about the violence and the hate that's at the core of this movement when we put them on the stand and hold them accountable, when we win these large judgments from a jury. Um, and this trial, which will take place over four or so weeks in Charlottesville, steps away from where the violence happened, will be such a powerful moment to understand this rise of extremism in America and hold those accountable for uh, who are at the center of that. Um, and we think it's so important to have that sort of continued public reckoning on these issues. We're already seeing a critical public reckoning right now with Black Lives Matter protests and yeah. so much else that is happening. Yeah. When we have that reckoning in the courts during a trial that is so public, when we put the violent hate that's at the core of this movement on the stand and hold them accountable, that will be quite powerful. Well, you definitely are putting the violent hate on the stand, and this is this is one of the I, one of the most important cases, um, quite frankly, of this of this century thus far. Um, and you're seeing so you're you're you're, you're um, witnessing a lot, and you're also having a chance to see a lot through the discovery phase. And you've mentioned it several times over the past few minutes about this movement, um, which Spencer calls the alt right movement. Um, his, he himself refers to it as that. So can you talk to us a little bit about this alt right movement? What is it um, through your lens, and how have you seen it? Um, grow, how, how do you see it um, expanding? And what keeps you up at night over the past? What has kept you up at night over the past few years about this? Well, you know it's movement but of course much like with any movement there are a variety of more specific ideologies at play here but i think at the same time you can take a step back and look at the same motivating ideology like you can see the clear thread between these various far-right extremist attacks in recent years and the same sort of ideology at play in so many of them and so these are you know these are these are fundamentalist white supremacist neo-nazis who believe that anyone who is not white by their definition, so n neither of us, for example, um, uh, would, you know, have a place here. Um, some, you know, some of them believe in a white ethno state, others are more, even more fundamentalist and radical in what they believe. Um, within this movement, there are different ideologies, including an increasingly concerning accelerationism, which believes that basically there needs to be we need to accelerate a sort of violent end to this society as we know it to bring about the white ethno state that they crave. Um, there are, I'm sure many folks have been hearing about boogaloo extremists who are not white supremacists 
per se, although there are Boogaloo extremists who are white supremacists and these extremists believe in a second civil war. Um, they are vehemently anti-government, pro-gun, um, and some of them are indeed white supremacists um, and white supremacists are in some cases Boogaloo extremists. Um, I think a useful way to understand the the ideology of this movement is to explore what's called replacement theory, which okay. is ideology that is at the center of what happened in Charlottesville and so many of the subsequent attacks. It's what they mean when they say Jews will not replace us, for example. And it's the idea that the Jews uh, are the puppet masters of an effort to essentially commit what they call white genocide, to replace the white race. And this applies to the rise of the African-American black communities. It applies to Muslims and Latinos and the LGBTQ community, and basically anyone who doesn't fit into their narrow, vile definition of what a person should be. Um, and uh, we see this over and over again. We saw it in Charlottesville again, Jews will not replace us. That is quite literally the definition of replacement theory. We saw it in Pittsburgh where that synagogue was targeted because they work with what's called the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society that supports refugees. Um, and so, you know, they saw it as Jews quite literally orchestrating refugees coming to America. We saw it in Christ Church, um, where the shooter there espoused the same ideology when he killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque. We saw it in Poway, California. We saw it in El Paso, where a white supremacist drove 10 hours out of his way to target a Walmart in a predominantly Latino community. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen it many other times since. And it's also the same sort of ideology you see creeping into more mainstream mainstream, quote unquote, Republican and other mm -hmm. uh, language where you see these sort of white nationalist ideas. You hear them talking about being replaced. I mean, I think I, I think Matt Gates, the, the member of Congress tweeted something this week about being replaced, how the Black Lives Matter protests want to replace this country. And it was, I don't want to say it's a dog whistle because a dog whistle implies that it was a little subtle. It was a straight out cry to this ideology in a lot of ways. And so I think to really understand the, the thread that runs from these inc these violent incidents um, is to understand this ideology that informs so much of their hate. Um, and that while it is slightly different among different organizations and different individuals and, and sort of sex, if you will, within the, the movement, it's the same far right ideology right. that uh, threads, you know, creates that thread between it all. So what are some key words that we should be looking, we should be listening for to give us an, you said it's, it's seeping into the mainstream conversation. What, what are obviously replacement, um, so and so replacing, but are there, are there any other key words or co-words that we should be tuning in for? You know, things like globalist and mm. power and influence are so often part of the same ideology. And we're actually seeing it play out right now with the Black Lives Matter protests, where you have these extremists trying to argue that George Soros is orchestrating these protests. And that conspiracy theory has the benefit of being both anti-Semitic and racist. It's anti-Semitic because George Soros as the puppet master is part of one of the most classic anti-Semitic conspiracy theories at this point. But it's also racist because it suggests that these protests, which are being led by Black people, and have, like, as I mentioned earlier, have been quite successful in making real change in the short period of time they've been happening, can't possibly be legitimate. They're only happening and they're only successful in seeing real power and impact because of George Soros pulling the strings. And so you know, things like that, hearing those sorts of, and you know, you hear that in this case, you're hearing it with regards to the Black Lives Matter protests, but you hear it with regards to so many other communities that these extremists target, whether it's the Muslim community, the Latino community, the LGBTQ community, and, and understanding the subtle ways that they weave, you know, this into their propaganda. Right. And we're also quite literally seeing an increase in propaganda from some of these groups, including Patriot Front, which has... Um, you know, posted flyers around the country, including like in places like Brooklyn that you wouldn't expect it, sort of talking about, sort of talk, talking about these ideas under the guise of patriotism, patriotism, yeah. protecting this country. And of course, we know what happened in your own community a few right. days ago. Yeah. In 
local newspaper, which is part and parcel of the same types of hate and the types of propaganda that we see here. Some of them are quite explicit, like what you uh, have been, I think, so powerfully outspoken about. And I'll let you sort of share some of the details. But at the same time, you sort of see that language trickle into sort of more palatable, supposedly patriotic yeah. sort of uh, propaganda and being able to understand that it's not going to be as explicit as you might expect it to be, yeah. um, but it will very much be part of these white nationalist propaganda efforts is right. important and scary. Well, it's terrifying. And also we have a very charged and politicized race right now, um, national race, um, that where one, one candidate is actually talking about and encouraging the use of force against protesters. And when we see that language, of course, it's very scary that it's happening here in America. It's very scary that it's happening right here in Tennessee. Um, and, and, um, and it's it's the term we use is it's political violence. It's inciting political violence. It's violence around an election um, and for um, electoral purposes. And that's also what we saw with that advertisement, which you were alluding to, that happened here in the Tennessee and just a couple of days ago with someone taking out an ad trying to um, incite hate, fear, and violence um, by claiming that Islam was going to drop a nuclear bomb in the middle of Nashville, which is of course not true. Um, but they had pictures of Donald Trump and the Pope um, on the advertisement, which was um, clearly a message that was trying to appeal to a certain audience, um, which thankfully um, 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 flopped and failed. And there was a huge um, pushback on that, including over 700 community members who signed a petition saying that standing up against such propaganda um, in the middle of our, uh, the largest newspaper in the state. Um, and we do have some questions that I want to get to, but before we get to those questions, I wanted to ask you two quick things. Um, one is actually probably not going to be so quick to answer, but um, we need to get to it because um, um, you're the expert on this and we need to be exposed to your knowledge around this, which is, um, you mentioned before uh, how a lot of these, this alt-right movement and these hate groups and individuals are using COVID-19, they're weaponizing COVID-19 as a bioweapon against um, against against individuals and groups in this country. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that and what you're seeing? Yeah. So, you know, in any moment of crisis, any moment of uncertainty, you see hate and fear yeah. grow. It's inevitable. It's like the tale is old as time. That is quite literally how it's always been. Um, in this case, it's been horrifying to see how quickly it has gone from sort of conspiracy theories on the internet to real world violence right. over the course of the pandemic. And then of course now with the Black Lives Matter protests, there's a whole other element to this. Um, and you see the same sorts of groups and individuals trying to take advantage of the protests to spread their violence and their hate, which I'll get to. So first, you know, starting in January and February when coronavirus was sort of a little twinkle in our eyes, but we had no idea what it would become you would start to see these anti-Asian conspiracies, anti-Semitic conspiracies, sometimes Islamophobic conspiracies about who was behind coronavirus. It was created in an Israeli lab. It was an effort by the Jews to assert their power and control us all. You could imagine how these go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then very quickly by March, we started to see this turn into real world violence. So there were talk, as you mentioned, um, on these extremist chat rooms of trying to use the virus as a bioweapon that would be targeted at Jews and other minorities and even at law enforcement, sort of like, you know, putting it on doorknobs and other things as a means to target specific communities. And thankfully, that effort was caught and stopped. I mean, we have no idea if it was ever used in that way um, right. or possible, frankly, to be used in that way. But the fact that there was right. very matter about it is should be alarming to all of us. And then, of course, it turned into real world, real world violence in other ways. I think we all know now the heinous, alarming rise in anti-Asian attacks that we've seen over the last few months, particularly starting around March and April as, as uh, lockdowns started and people were targeting, finding, trying to find a scapegoat in their community. Then, of course, we would also see these white supremacists and other extremists try, you know, talk about how they could use this to further their broader goals. And so, for example, 
a man in Missouri who is a member of National Socialist Movement, one of the defendants in our suit, a neo-Nazi group, um, was thankfully stopped but tried to bomb a hospital that was treating coronavirus patients. And this, they believe, was part of his, quote, accelerationist plan to help speed about the collapse of this society through targeting key infrastructure, in this case, hospitals, but others have talked about targeting things like power grids and other things. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, he was stopped. He, he died during a standoff with the FBI. Um, there have been many other incidents, including a Jewish assisted living facility in Massachusetts, where there was an attempted arson attack by another extremist. Thankfully, he was not successful. Um, but over and over again, we've seen these various extremists try to take advantage of this pandemic to spread hate, spread uh, terror, and then in some cases try to turn it into real world violence. Right. That, of course, now with the protests has been compounded because you see the same sorts of groups and individuals try to distract from the very legitimate fights and conversations that are happening right now on racial justice and police brutality and so much more by spreading disinformation, hate, and violence. And so another defendant in our suit, a group called Identity Europa, which now goes by American Identity Movement, posed as Antifa in a viral tweet that uh, suggested violence and looting in white neighborhoods. That tweet went viral. It turned out it was actually written by this neo-Nazi group. Um, Twitter ultimately pulled it down, but not before it was used by many others to sort of justify, you know, their armed counter rallies where they would show up and, you know, with their massive guns and threaten protesters and stand there sort of threateningly to protect against Antifa, as they said. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it's, it's almost too much to count at this point. We actually have a, a post on our website. If you go to integrityfirstforamerica.org, folks can read it and click through to some of the news articles about this, but there has been a shocking and horrifying amount of, of actual violence targeted at protesters and others at this point. So in some cases, these are the Boogaloo extremists that I mentioned who believe in a second civil war. Um, and we've seen them including, for example, three Boogaloo extremists were arrested and just indicted last week by a grand jury in Las Vegas for trying to blow up a Black Lives Matter protest there with a Molotov cocktail. Um, that was, I think, one of the first major incidences we, we saw involving Boogaloo extremists. But of course, it hasn't stopped there. I think most notably, um, an extremist and his accomplice um, killed two separate law enforcement officials. One was a Santa Cruz sheriff's deputy, and another one was a federal Department of Homeland Security um, security officer in California over the course of a few days and injured others um, and was part of these Boogaloo groups on Facebook and elsewhere. Um, and there have been extensive other examples, whether it's you know weapons confiscated from some of these guys who were showing up at protests um, or others. We've started to see even social media companies and there's so much to be said about what they must yeah. do. Maybe we'll um, have another session for that because I, I think it would be good to get your insights there too. But even just today, Facebook, uh, you know, said that they were banning certain Boogaloo content as a means to uh, start to address this. Of course, it's insufficient and there's so much more. Yeah. And I want to pick your brain um, next time on, on why there's so, why Facebook and, and other social media platforms and companies are so slow to respond um, to this. Um, but that's another conversation. Before we get to the, we have two questions and, and more, but before that, we're going to have time for two questions. But before I get to those, just really quick while we have everybody on, um, how can we help? How can every individual on this call um, help you with your mission, which obviously serves all of our um, individual and communal interests? Well, thank you for asking. And, and this helps because we want people to know that this is happening. So ah. thank you the conversations and you for for making this happen mm -hmm. um so you know there's a there's some micro things that people can do and some macro things that people yeah, can do micro level we are preparing for a trial this fall and so anything people can do to let their friends and family and colleagues know that this is happening we are so grateful for on our website integrityfirstforamerica.org you could sign up for case updates you can Go to our activist toolkit and there's sample social media content there that you could use, including even a sample email you could adapt to send to your networks. You can donate. Everything that we raise goes directly to support case costs, specifically security costs, because 
there has been a not small amount of threats, as I think you mentioned earlier, um, and evidence collection costs. So when we get those great orders requiring the defendants to hand over their phones and computers and social media and email accounts, it's not cheap to scrape that evidence off of those devices and our plaintiffs pay for them. And so therefore we pay for it. And so uh, everything we raise directly supports the case in that way. Um, and so integrityfirstforamerica.org, sign up, go to the social media uh, accounts on our page or the sample social media content and spread the word, donate if you can, um, and you know, reach out to us if there are other ways um, that you think uh, you would like to help us spread the word. But more broadly, I think we are living at a time where there's so much information and news and whatever the president tweeted on a given day can easily consume the news cycle. And so it's easy for these issues to slip out of the headlines. Yeah. And people, you know, who care about the future of this country, about the values that it's supposed to represent, need to hold the people who work for them accountable to their responsibilities here. And whether that's in some cases calling out officials who might traffic in that language, as you, but also ensuring that the elected officials are actually looking at the legislation and the policy changes that need to happen here. There's a lot of tools that they have at their disposal and holding law enforcement and policymakers accountable for using those tools that exist right now is key. But there are also some basic changes like the No Hate Act and the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act that would make some fairly common sense changes to how, for example, local, state, and federal law enforcement coordinate on domestic terror threats like this right. um, or require specific attention to white supremacy in the military, which has become a yeah. increasingly concerning issue. Um, and so making sure your policymakers, the law enforcement officials in your communities are doing, are upholding their end of the bargain and similarly, as you alluded, there's the private sector and there's so much there that needs to happen. Um, just because something like the First Amendment exists doesn't mean that a platform like Facebook or Discord or Gab needs to give license to heinous, violent speech and other conduct on their platform. Their terms of service don't need to allow for a free for all. That is not something that is protected by the First Amendment. Um, and so they have an obligation to make sure that hate on their platforms and in particular violent hate on their platforms is being dealt with and taken on. And we know for a fact that deplatforming works in many cases. Richard Spencer himself said it in court in our case a few weeks ago. He complained that he's been deplatformed from so many sites he can't raise money, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means deplatforming is working. And so um, this isn't just on the public sector. There are also clear actions that the private sector can take um, there's an interesting campaign happening now called Stop Hate for Profit that the ADL and Sleeping Giants and then NAACP and others um, are behind encouraging um, major businesses to hold their Facebook ad dollars until Facebook takes some basic steps. Um, and there's a lot that we can do as private citizens to make sure those who work for us or the businesses who we give our business to right. are, are um understanding where our priorities are. Yeah, so absolutely. And let me just run through these questions real quick in the in the final 10 minutes that we have. Um, the first question there, there, and thank you everyone for sending um, the, um, these questions. Um, one is, as the trial unfolds, what access to the proceedings will the public have, Amy? And do you think this will be covered by major news organizations on a nightly basis? I hope so. Um, so we think that this trial will generate significant national media attention. It's really hard, even in this day and age, to ignore a trial happening in Charlottesville blocks away from where the violence happened, where the leaders of this movement who plan that violence are being held accountable. Um, and so we think it will certainly get major national media attention. It has to date not at the level that it might in normal times, but we have been very heartened by the response to date and uh, many of those clips are on our website um, if you're looking for something to share with friends. Um, it's federal court, so, tech, so it's unclear if cameras are gonna be allowed in the courtroom and that's something that I know local TV and others are um, likely petitioning for. Um, we'll see how that unfolds, but either way, we at IFA are gonna be putting out daily updates about what happened in court if you sign up on our website for case updates, 
Um, we will make sure that you get those regular updates. And as you know, we will fight tirelessly to ensure that um, people around the country are seeing what happens in this trial um, regularly um, as, as clearly as possible. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's just too crucial not to. And um, we've had a couple of questions, which I'm going to combine into one here in our last few minutes. And it's something that you and I um, and people who, who are national security practitioners talk about frequently. Um, but if you, have, if you can take five minutes to try to answer it, um, from, in your opinion, why is extremism increasing? Why, why is this ideology of hate and paranoia um, rising um, during this particular time in history? And um, are there foreign countries who are also investing in some of these um, social media efforts to promote and uh, this propaganda, which we're seeing fuel, fear, hate, and, and violence, and in some instances, political violence? The short answer is yes. And you wouldn't be surprised to hear, to hear that. Yeah. Um, the first half of that. I think, look, there's so many reasons that extremism is on the rise, but there's two that seem crystal clear to me. One is the rise of social media has allowed these individuals and groups to connect in ways that they couldn't. So in the past, you know, we didn't talk about this, one of the central statutes in our suit is something called the Ku Klux Klan Act, right. originally in 1971 years ago, to protect against Klan violence in the South, and we're using it now to protect against the same sort of racist, violent conspiracies. And one of the things I like to say and point out is is how really there's not much of a difference between the violence the Klansmen were executing in the South 150 years ago when this was conceived of and the violence we saw in Charlottesville and so many other places. The only major difference is instead of meeting in their white hoods in the woods somewhere in the South, they are meeting on social media and then convening from around the country like they did in Charlottesville. And so in many ways, social media has become the Klan den of the 21st century and it has allowed them to connect at a scale and at a level that they weren't able to previously, both planning things like what happened in Charlottesville and inspiring other extremists to action as we saw from Pittsburgh to Christchurch to Poway to El Paso and in many other circumstances. And so you can't understand the rise of extremism without understanding the role of the internet and social media in, in helping to fuel it. And, how it's been exploited by these extremists to do so. But also, and, and we spoke a bit about this earlier, they are so emboldened right now. Mm -hmm. And whether it is the winks and the nods, or in some cases, not dog whistles, but full on sirens they're getting from people in the highest levels of our government. You know, obviously, like there's no, obviously, you know, Trump retweeted a guy shouting white power just a few days ago. And that is not the most egregious example, I think, of how they have been given these little nods over the last few years. Um, it's all part and parcel of the same, you know, find people on both sides sort of ideology that has, has been prevalent. And so they are particularly emboldened. Um, and in moments like this right now, where you have things like the pandemic that can be used to further exploit these tensions and um, disinformation campaigns, like the one I described by our own defendant to pretend to be Antifa, it just seeks to sort of play on those racial tensions and bring people into the fold um, by taking advantage of the moment. Um, and I think that's a natural segue into the second part of the question, which is the role of um, foreign actors here. And unsurprisingly, there are deep connections between many of our defendants and foreign groups, including, for example, the Russian Imperial Movement, which was just designated a foreign terror organization by the State Department a few months ago, the first white supremacist group to have been designated as such. Um, Matthew Heimbach, one of our defendants, is, uh, has been um, deeply connected to them. Similarly, the Nordic resistance movement, a French group, Generation Identitaire, was the inspiration for Identity Europa. You can sort of go on and on about these sorts of connections that exist between these groups and the ways in which this is a global movement that requires a global response. Yeah. Um, and so, and in many of these cases, unsurprisingly, um, the sort of disinformation campaigns that are a hallmark of foreign influence, that, like we saw in 2016, are exactly what we see many of these groups and their supporters trying to do right now with that Antifa tweet being sort of the most obvious example. Yeah, and I don't know if you saw this, but we dropped just today with millions of conversations a pledge against disinformation um, as they are, it's one of the key ways that people are using 
uh, are, are fueling hate, fear, and violence. Um, and so we have to address disinformation campaigns and misinformation campaigns. Um, um, and um, also, I would just say this gets right back to your other point, which um, is why this is happening is in part people in respected positions and in power and, and leaders are um, making and helping create these authorizing environments for cruelty. So the way in which we're going to counter that is that we ourselves have to stand up and have to speak out and have to speak up um, and have to work together um, to make sure that, that that is kept on the fringes rather than and, and hopefully we can eradicate it, um, but at that, you know, at, you know, to keep it on the fringes rather than it creeping into the mainstream, which is what we're seeing right now, which creates more of this unauthorizing environment for cruelty. Um, and Amy, we're right at um, our, our hour mark here. Um, and I just wanted to just say again, thank you so much. And also um, to encourage everyone to support your efforts. And it's the best way to do that by going on your website. If someone wants to make a donation, a grassroots donation here is to do it through your website. It's integrityfirstforamerica.org. Um, if you register for this, I think we'll also get out some follow-up information to you about the various things you heard about, I imagine on both the great work Millions of Conversation is, is doing and um, the, uh, the, the lawsuit and how you can follow it on our end. And are you most active on Twitter? We are on Twitter. Um, that's where the most regular updates are, but we're also on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. If they're gonna try to take over social media, we think the best way to do that is to fight back with information about they're with you. You. Are right there with you and I found your updates to be uh, most informative so thank you for that and thank you for everything that you're doing and for your time and your team's time as well yes. thank you so much we are so thrilled to partner with you on this and everything else that uh, you all are doing to take on hate likewise together we'll get there <laughs> all right well thank you thank you to everyone for joining